Several days, several nights. No, nope, it ain't been done through there. <laughs> yeah. I want to say thank you to our brother Randall Boyd who cured the problem. You remember the Sunday when the power was off? Yeah. We've got a box back there, an electric box, that runs on electricity that tells it when it's time to turn the light on. And when the power was off, the box was off. And so Randall, Randall corrected that. And thank you, Randall and Donna, for deadheading the rose bushes this last week. They look better. It is wonderful to see you here this morning. Glad that COVID seems to be leaving. And we hope it's gone and don't come back. Anybody got any idea how many times the word God's found in the Bible? Once or twice. Once or twice. <laughs> 4,444 times the word God is in the Bible. And very often, the word God, whenever we see it in the Bible, it is connected with the verb said. In other words, very often we find the Bible telling us God said something. God's words and His commands have been freely given to us. And man, aren't you glad that they have? That's the only way that we know how to get to heaven. The only way that we know how we're supposed to live is through His words. God's words have been freely given to us for a reason. Peter writes about that reason in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. He says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the glory through the knowledge of him who hath called us to glory and virtue. You want to know how to become a Christian? God says, I'll tell you. It's down, it's written, it's available. You want to know how you can live that good Christian life? God says, I told you, it's written, it's there for your reading. God has given us that information. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Now that word perfect there doesn't mean sinless, sin free. We can't do that. Jesus did it. We can't do that. But that word perfect there means that God's Word is designed so you can be the best that you have the ability to be. And if you'll do your best with what ability that you have to do, then you're going to go to heaven. You don't have to be the greatest preacher. don't have to be the greatest song leader. don't have to be the greatest mommy. don't have to be the greatest daddy. But if you'll do the best you can do, you'll make it to heaven. God has provided us with all we need in order for us to be spiritually the best that we can be. How did He give us those things? Well, that's simple. He gave us His precious Word by men who were inspired of the Holy Spirit and they wrote it down in the Bible. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You want to have faith? Well, you've got to have the Word of God. You read the Word of God or you hear the Word of God preached. And it teaches you how to have faith 
and what that faith is. Want to know what God said? Well, it's laid down in written form for us all to read and understand. Let's consider this morning some of the things that God has said and see if we can apply them to our lives. Let's start off with going back in time. Let's go, oh, let's go way back. 6,000 years ago. The beginning of time as far as the cosmos is concerned. God has created the heaven and the earth, and the word used there for God, of course, is that Hebrew word Elohim, which is a, a, a plural word. In other words, God's created the heaven and the earth. You say, now wait a minute, there's only one God. Yes, there's only one God family, which consists of the Father and the Son, or the Word, as John called Him in John chapter 1, and the Holy Spirit. All three working as one to create not only the heavens that we can see at nighttime, but the earth on which we dwell. Well, the Bible tells us in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the heaven and the earth. In Genesis 1-2, we read that there was darkness upon the face of the deep. The earth was covered with water in the very beginning. There was no light shining upon the waters. Thus, we read, then get to verse 3 of Genesis chapter 1, and we're able to read, And God said, <coughs> And God said, Let there be light. And lo and behold, there was light. You know, light's necessary for our existence. You've got to have light to see. We know that. The plants have to have life to grow. No light, no plants. The animals that eat that plants won't have food to eat. The animals that eat the animals that eat the plants, they won't have food to eat. And the final message there would be, without plants, without herbivores, without carnivores, there's no man. Because we've got to have food to eat too. Thus, God knew that there would be, need to be light. It's a necessity. Thus, in His wisdom, He knew this, and God made light. Let there be light. And there was light. Spiritually, Jesus came to bring light to the world and salvation to mankind. We read in John chapter 1 of Jesus, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, the light described as the Word by John. And He was in the beginning with God. But He leaves heaven to come to this earth to be the perfect sacrifice for the sins of humanity. In John chapter 1 and verse 4, we read that in Him, in Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men. Following the time that our Lord was triumphant over the temptations that the devil laid upon Him, the Bible says that Jesus left Judea where the temptations took place and He headed north. And He goes up to His hometown of Nazareth. Don't know how long He was there, but He left Nazareth and He goes on up to the village of Capernaum on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. Now, there in Capernaum is very near the coast of two of the tribes of Israel. One of those was the tribe of Zebulon, and the other was the tribe of Naphtali. So Jesus makes the journey, and He goes all the way up to there. And He did it because it had been prophesied that He would. In fact, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 2, 700 years before Jesus ever made that journey, Isaiah the prophet said, He's going to make that journey. Now it is repeated in Matthew chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, where we read these words. 
The land of Zabulon, spelled a little bit different from the Old Testament spelling, and the land of Naphtalim, again spelled a little bit different from the Old Testament writing, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Listen him. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. What was that light that made the journey up there? It was Jesus. He came to bring light, spiritual light, to this world. The psalmist writes in Psalms 119.105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Oh, the only way we know where to go spiritually, the only way we know what to do spiritually, is through the Word. The inspired Word. Oh yeah. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Students of the Word of God know exactly what I'm about to teach. On the sixth day of creation, God made animals and man. God brought the animals He had made to man, Adam, so Adam could name them all. And you know all those animals had mates. The rooster had the hen. The dog had male and female. All the animals had male and female. But Adam didn't have a mate. And so Genesis 2.18 tells us, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. That word meet, I'll make him a help meet for him. I've heard people say I'll make him a help mate. It's not mate, it's meat. And that word meat has a specific meaning. The word meat means a suitable helper for man or light unto him. The male hippo had a female hippo. She was like her mate. The hen and the rooster were like one another. Adam didn't have a mate like unto him. And so God created a help meet for him. One that was like a human mate. That's simply what it means. So God causes a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, took a rib out of this man, fashioned a woman who was going to be a suitable helper for man. And after fashioning the woman, brought her to Adam, and you know what happened? The first marriage came into being. For we read in Genesis 2.25 that Adam and Eve were a man and his wife. That's God's plan. One man, one woman, constitutes a marriage in the eyes of God. In Matthew chapter 19, the Bible tells us that Pharisees came to Jesus our Lord. And they came to Him trying to tempt Him so that they could get Jesus to say something whereby they could condemn Him for teaching falsehood. They asked the Lord a question, and here was the question. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Well, Jesus reminds the Pharisees of what we have just studied a few minutes ago. In the beginning, God made them male and female, and they in marriage would become one flesh, and that was to be in the eyes of God. And then in Matthew 19, 6, Jesus says, What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. In other words, Jesus says God's plan was for one man and one woman to be united in marriage and for that marriage to last until death. The Pharisees go on. They say, well, if that's true, why then did Moses command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? And the answer that Jesus gives is this, found in Matthew 19.8. 
Jesus says, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you, permitted you, to put away your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. Jesus then gives the only acceptable cause of divorce as far as God is concerned. If one's mate cheats in the marriage vow, then the innocent party can divorce and remarry. The guilty one must remain unmarried. Because if they marry, they commit adultery. And not only do they commit adultery, but the one they married also commits adultery. You know what, if you leave immediately following services, let me suggest that, that you miss a wonderful opportunity because very often we'll stay, there'll be several of us who will stay together and we'll talk about this, talk about that, and we'll talk about the Bible. And very often somebody will come up with a question and so we'll spend time here at the building, an hour or more, answering questions that that people come up with. Well, that happened last Wednesday. <clears throat> the question was brought up last Wednesday about the Old Testament and how the Old Testament talks about how that back in those days, instruments of music were used in worship to God. And, and so that's a, that's a good, as, as our brother would say on Facebook, that's a good question. At least three times in the Old Testament, God has permitted things to take place, to occur, which He did not authorize. In other words, it didn't come from God, it came from man. But God finally said, under the Old Testament, okay, you, if that's what you want, then that's what you can have. One of them is divorce. In the beginning, that's not what God wanted. That's what the people wanted. And even though God did not want it, yet finally He said, okay, Moses tell the people the husband can give their wives a writing of divorcement. That's one of them. Number two, God never wanted Israel to have a king over them. But that's what the people wanted. The people wanted their nation to be like the nations round about them. Here was a man who came out who was king. He had on a crown. He had on his royal apparel. And the people were just thrilled to have this man that they could physically see to be their king. And that's what Israel said. That, that's what we want. Well, Israel wanted a king over them. In 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 7, God speaks to Samuel, the prophet of God at this time, and God says to Samuel, Samuel, don't be so upset. The people have not rejected thee. They have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You see, God wanted to be the king over His nation. But they kept crying out, we want a king, and God finally relented. So divorce, although not authorized by God, was permitted. A king, although not authorized by God, yet was permitted. Why did God let the people have what they wanted? Make them happy. Another thing never authorized by God, yet God did relent and permit that use of instrumental music. Do you realize it was not until the time of King David? The world had been in existence for 3,000 years. People had been worshiping God for 3,000 years. And nowhere in that 3,000 year period did God say, I want you to worship me by using instruments of music. Not, not once. But 
But then along comes King David. And King David, you'll remember, was a man who loved to play upon the harp. And so it was that King David was the one who introduced 3,000 years after the beginning of time instrumental music in worship to God. God never authorized it, but God permitted it. Okay. Many times throughout the Old Testament, God spoke. He had been known to speak man to man like He did to Moses up on Mount Sinai. God and Moses spoke just like you and I can speak one to another. There were times when God would use a, a, a human to speak, such as in the time when God told Jonah to go to that wicked city Nineveh, the capital of the country of Assyria, and preach to those people, deliver a message that the city of Nineveh needs to repent or else they will perish. God even spoke in Numbers 22 through the mouth of the donkey being ridden by Balaam. You know, God speaks to us today. He speaks to us through nature. Do you realize that? Psalms 19 and verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Oh, we look up into the heavens at night time and we see that which God created in the very beginning of time. We look into the sky during the daytime and we realize that it was the very voice of the Almighty that put that sky into, his, into existence. Yeah, God speaks through His creation. And His creation tells us He is God. But as we study the idea of God speaking to us today, we, we, we've got to look at the words that are found in Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. They were able to read that God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. Who do we listen to today? Do we listen to the law of Moses today? Do we listen to the prophets as they prophesied the Word of God all down through the Old Testament ages? Well, the answer is no. We listen to Jesus today. You remember when Jesus, well, you don't remember, but the Bible tells us, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up into a high mountain north of the Sea of Galilee. While there, Jesus was transfigured into His face shone as the sun, and His clothing was white as light. And with Him appeared two more, Moses and Elijah. Peter speaks up on the occasion, and in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 4, Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us make us here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for Moses. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 17 and verse 5 that while he yet spake, while Peter yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Not Moses, not Elijah. Listen to the words of Jesus. So important it is that we listen and heed the words of our Lord that Jesus tells us in John 12, 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Doesn't it behoove us then to, with the best of our ability, to learn what Jesus said? Because that's what we're going to meet on the judgment day. Did you do what Jesus said? Well, what did He say? Well, let's find out. 
Let's open our Bibles. Let's read it. Let's learn it. So we'll know what we're supposed to do. Listen to the words of Jesus as recorded in Mark 16, 16. These words are going to meet us on the judgment day. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Let God speak to you today through His Son. I had a fellow write to me this last week on the internet. And I believe that he was as sincere as he could be. He believed that God speaks to him through dreams. He told me, he said, it's when I'm half asleep and half awake. And he said, when I'm half asleep and half awake, very often I'll hear the voice of God. And God will speak to me. I tried to explain to him that God had never spoken to me. And God is not a respecter of persons. If God's going to talk to Doug, God's going to talk to Ronnie. And God's going to talk to Adam. Because He does not respect people. I don't think I ever did get through to him that he told me he was amazed that God had never spoken to me. He said, I thought he spoke to everybody. No. God speaks to us through the words of Jesus. That's how God speaks to us today. Listen, today if you're not a Christian, would you obey the words that Jesus gave? That way whenever eternity comes and whenever you stand before Him on that day, you will know that you have obeyed the words by which you'll be judged. Today, if you're not a Christian, be baptized for the remission of your sins. Those sins washed away. You become a child of God. The Bible says in Acts 2.47 that the Lord adds to the church daily those who are being saved. You don't have to join the church. You become a Christian, the Lord adds you to His church. If you're here today and as a Christian you've wandered astray, you need to come home. The invitation is yours. Please, come on together and stand in this thing. Oh,